Hi, Hi. Hi. You okay? Yeah, how are you? I'm good, thank you. Do you want my, uh, I don't drink tea, so I've got my, is that all right? <laughs> You've got your vimp toe, as promised. Yeah, vimp toe all the way. <laughs> Love it. Oh, thank you so much for joining me. I'm so excited for this, I can't tell you. I know, I am too. Right, so just a little bit of background for everyone. Stacey Copeland is an absolute legend, okay? I promise you, within the next 30 minutes, you will be utterly inspired. Um, but as a background, so for most people, reaching the pinnacle of their sport is sufficient enough achievement. Stacey Copeland has achieved that in two sports. Um, so she's a current professional boxer, um, and a light middleweight professional, the first British woman to ever win a Commonwealth Games title. But before achieving that in the ring, she was a professional footballer and uh, played for England under-18s, also played in an FA Cup final, which is pretty cool. Um, yeah. An all round legend of sport, but also a huge advocate for gender equality, women's sport, and just driven by making a positive difference within society. I can't wait to pick her brain. I'm so excited. It's a pleasure to have you. Thank you so much for joining me. You too. And I think we should stick to our promise. And right. You have to ask your first question in Mank, and I'll try and answer in Cockney. <coughs> Don't make it a long <laughs> answer. Okay. 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 So my first question usually <laughs> is how you like your tea. All right, but because you're a Vimto drinker, I've had to change this up a little bit. Okay. okay. So I'm going to base it around what you like to eat instead. All right, you have to right. ask me in Mank. You've got to do a Mank accent to ask me. Okay. Do, okay, question one. Do you prefer chocolate, cake, or biscuit? <laughs> uh, I'll reply in Cockney. Uh, well, I like chocolate. <laughs> I feel like you've got that. Nailed it. Nailed it. Okay. Question number two. <laughs> Chinese or a Thai? Uh, I like Chinese and I like sweet and sour chicken. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Question number three. Okay. Breakfast. No, that went very good. <laughs> Breakfast, lunch, or dinner? Oh, that's hard, that. Uh, I know. We kind of, well, we have dinner at, in the, at when you have lunch, and yeah. then we have tea at night. So, oh, that's tough, that. I'd say um, tea, dinner, that, at night. That wasn't it. At night, dinner, at night. Okay. Right. <laughs> Number four. <clears throat> Nando's plain, medium, or hot? Uh, medium, be because uh, anything spicy, I don't like it. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like you're putting me to shame here. Okay, question <laughs> number five. Question number five. Why, no, why Vimto? Uh, I, I don't drink coffee or tea, but I love Vimto and it's Mancunian, isn't it? It's Northern. <laughs> <laughs> I thought you might be a Yorkshire tea drinker, but I'm pleased you gave me nah, the... Nah, I know. Yeah. I think we did pretty well there with our accents, actually. I feel like I'm a bit out of my depth, to be honest. I still need work, but um, I think you did all right, to be fair. And to be fair, you've got to tell everyone, you have got the Essex roots, haven't you? I have. Yeah, I was, I was born in Essex, and I was there for about, I don't know, we left before I was one. But, um, yeah, I did live there because my dad was a boxer at um, Terry Lawless's gym in Romford. Amazing. So I was born there, but Around raised here. That's why I speak like this. <laughs> Well, what could have been, eh? What could have been? But anyway, a bit of a different start compared to usual, but yeah. um, fun nevertheless. So I've, I've already pre-warned you that I ask all of my Cup and Natter guests three questions, okay? And my first question comes from my Cup and Natter guest from Monday, 
I mean, Olympic, World, European, Commonwealth Games champion, um, cycling legend Katie Archibald. And Katie admitted that she loves to write lists. She has a list for everything. I'm she like that. <laughs> favourite book, favourite everything, anything under the sun she has a list for. And she wants to know, what is your favourite film of all time and why? It's a tough one, this, you know, because actually there's, there's probably a couple from when I was a kid and they're yeah. completely different. So both childhood films. Uh, one that I absolutely loved as a kid was Rocky. Because uh, oh, yeah. I, I thought Rocky was real. Me and my dad always used to watch Rocky and I just thought it was a true story, um, <laughs> which is in a way. But um, yeah. So I loved Rocky because it's a big part of my childhood and me and my dad used to watch it and then uh, he used to give me a Mars bar and Maltesers and a can of Coke, terrible nutritionist. And we used to like cool. toy fight in the living room and stuff. So I used to love Rocky. And then the other one, which is totally different, was Mary Poppins, which ah! I just loved. Poppins. So, yeah. That's what I was trying to do and... when I was doing my accent. I was trying to channel my inner Bert. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you, you tried to channel Bert. You did say, you did big it up that if Bert can make a Cockney accent, then yeah. you could make a Cockney accent. I think it still needs a little bit of work, but I'll take it. Um, but going back to what you're saying about Rocky, did that ever like kind of kickstart your love for boxing, or were you already involved in the sport when um, when you started watching? I think just because my dad was a boxer and my granddad was a coach, and that I was always going to be introduced to it, uh, just as our whole families had the opportunity to be, because it's in the family. But as to quite why I loved it, I don't know because, yeah. like I said, my siblings had the same exposure and just never wanted to do it at all but I did so I don't know why we love what we love but it, that's yeah. something that always fascinates me how people get interested in what they're interested in and what sparks that moment for them and um, so I don't really know what that was but I was just grateful I got the opportunity to to try it as a sport really. It, it's an interesting one I mean going back to the films two crackers two absolute crackers of films but I'll give you that but um I guess that leads quite nicely onto my first, uh, my second question. So, um, as you said, your granddad had his own boxing gym. Your dad was a um, boxer himself, and you started boxing at the age of six. And I guess you kind of clocked onto their their passion and had that instant love for the for the sport straight away. And as I said, you've had an incredible, incredible, incredible career so far in the amateur boxing. You you were the European silver medalist. And as I said, when you've turned pro as well, you've won five out of five of your bouts. So you, you're doing something right, I must admit. And then thinking back to also the football stage where, you know, you played for Doncaster Bells, Tranmere Rovers, both within the Women's Premier League. Uh, as I said, you played in the FA Cup final. You've played abroad, both in Sweden and in America. Your yeah. sporting career has been pretty impressive. And I guess I want to know, what kind of made you think about specialising in football um, initially? And then what kind of caused that shift across to the boxing later on, further down the line? Um, so football, um, I just, I, I have even less idea why I liked football, because everyone in my family is crap. No offence <laughs> if they are, they are the crap at football. Um, I thought my dad was good when I was little because when we used to play in the garden, he used to do this one move that I could never get the ball off him and it, it was just a drag back. It's just where you put your foot on the ball and, and I fell for it every time. So I thought he was really good and as I got older, I was like, that's, that's all he's got. That's it. <laughs> that's one move. So um, nobody's any good at footy. So I, but I just remember at playtime, uh, just not being interested in what the girls were doing. And I did have a lot of girls who were mates, um, but they were doing you know stuff with elastic bands and scotch and getting married just I was like nah <laughs> one for me I just wanted to play football um, and yeah. so again it's hard to say what on earth drew me to it but I just loved it and um, what made me go into it is kind of because I, even though I did boxing and football when I got to the age of 11 when you can usually start boxing um, me and my little mates who we'd always done you know we did all the training that together went to my granddad I said right right I'm ready to box and he said oh you, you can't box kid I said, what are you talking about? And he said, it's illegal for girls. And I just couldn't believe it. I was, I was like, what? I, I, it was bizarre to me. So <laughs> then I knew, I knew there was like a totally closed door for me, at least to compete in boxing. And I was ready to compete. I was a driven, competitive kid. But by then there was opportunities coming into girls' football because the Football Association 
started to recognise women's football from 93 onwards. Um, so I started going to these girls' teams training, which I'd never been, and played football with all girls before. And it was amazing. And I got to my first sessions, there was all these little girls just like me. It was like little shin pads and footy boots on. I was like, oh my God, here's my people. <laughs> it's amazing. Um, and it also coincided when I'd watched The Karate Kid. Did you watch The Karate Kid? Good remember deal, the frame? Yeah. The movie did at the end when he was like yeah, this and yeah, he yeah. kick. Well, I decided to do that on the banister at the top of my stairs, uh, which didn't go well. And I like went down the stairs really quickly and I broke this bone here, the humorous, which isn't funny at all. Nah. And <laughs> I couldn't box for ages. So oh, the boxing took a back burner anyway. I started playing for loads of girls' footy teams. And so the football like really took off for me then. And that was it for many years. And I always kept up my boxing training. But football was my entire life for the next, uh, well, I guess, 15, 16 years it was. It's so interesting, isn't it? Because, I mean, I, I don't know whether I'm reading into this, but if you hadn't have had that injury, could things have been completely different within where you did specialise in terms of the boxing? That could have been your main sport. And then, I, yeah, I guess, do you think... But possibly, that... but, yeah, I think... I think I think I would have always gone into football because there were so many opportunities yeah. starting to come for you know there was proper leagues teams a structure in place um, and I needed that I was ready for that I wanted to be part of a team and think of things I could win and try and win them as part of a team so I think that was always the case but interestingly it was definitely an injury that that forced the transition from football to boxing because I'd had a lot of injuries anyway um, but my last year in America I broke my leg and I, I did manage to get back for the last couple of games and we reached the what's called the Sweet 16 over there the national championships and we went to California played in a game there it was just an amazing experience until we got to a penalty shootout and uh, she saved my penalty and their, their team scored theirs which ended the game which meant they won and just standing on the pitch in that moment I mean for anyone who's had that devastating kind of moment in sport which you do get that's what makes it amazing that raw emotion but when you're on the bad side of it it's horrendous and I just knew when I was watching that team celebrate like that and my world felt like it just completely crumbled in I just knew uh, I would never feel the same about football again and I didn't I just I still loved it but I never ever felt the same again and I knew in my head I was like right it's time to box and by then Boxing was legal for women. They had a national championship, so we were talking about it coming to the Olympics. I just felt like it was my time. Um, and I was old, I was 29, but I'd kept up with my training and I thought, well, you know, I don't want to leave it any longer, do I? <laughs> do you know, it's no. now or never. And so I got it and I'm so glad I did. I mean, and, and the rest is history, I guess. But it's really, it's fascinating. I find it fascinating because you hear about elite athletes that play lots of different sports when they're younger and then they choose to specialise um, one sport, you know, when the time comes. And your journey is a little bit different. And as well, the fact that you went from a team sport into an individual sport is quite unique yeah. in itself. Um, and when you touched upon, um, you carried on your boxing, your boxing training throughout your, your football career. Yeah. Did you ever have that thought, actually, this is what I want to do instead? I never thought it was what I wanted to do instead, but I did yeah. always have in the back of my mind, I wonder if I'll ever get the chance to actually do it. Yeah. And I think, I suppose it depends how long you do a sport for, because you're quite right, you know, you have like your childhood years where you try everything, then you specialise. Mm -hmm. And usually people that, you know, specialise time or whatever is maybe 10 years for some people or whatever, you know, they get dead serious late teens and then they, they're done by the late 20s. And I guess that's yeah. what makes it different for me that I'm now very 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 old um nah. and, uh, you know, coming coming to the end obviously and I've, I've had been very really fortunate to have kind of two careers if you like um yeah. and i guess it helps that they kind of use different body parts um uh, because my, my knees were knackered from football <laughs> uh luckily i don't have to use them quite as much in boxing but um so i've been really fortunate that i got to have those two opportunities and and it's funny because yeah you do, it is a team sport football obviously and, and boxing isn't once in some ways because it's just you that gets in the ring but it's very much a team that gets you ready for it like it's it's a really really you know team oriented thing you know you can't get ready for a fight without your coach you can't 
you know, get through the fight without your coach. Those minutes in between each round are dead vital. So you definitely feel like you're part of a team. But yeah. then again, the, the competitive bit's different. That when you walk on the pitch for football, you are actually competing as a team. Whereas in boxing, yes, you've got a team, yeah. but it is just you that does the competing. And those are the things that I love about both. So that's why I could never pick what's best about both. The best thing about football is being part of that team, like yeah. actually competing together. The best bit about boxing is that it's all on you and it's such an intense personal challenge. And I like both of those. It's incredible. I mean, I've never actually thought about it in terms of, you know, you see boxing, you see boxing as an individual sport. But as you said, it's not really, is it? It's a no. whole collective effort. And um, I've never really thought about it like that. But it's, it's fascinating. I, I, I am in awe of how you have achieved so much in both your sports. And I think it's remarkable, remarkable, honestly. Um, but just as remarkable is your work and achievements off the pitch, off the football pitch and outside of the ring. So um, I think it speaks volumes for the amount that you've achieved uh, away from sport and, you know, out the ring, off the pitch. Uh, in your driven character, wanting to make a difference, as I said earlier, you've got your own BBC Radio Manchester show. You've spoken in the um, European Parliament and the United Nations about uh, women's sport. And also, you've uh, founded your own charity called Pave the Way. Um, you founded it in 2017. And the aim of it is that gender should not be a barrier for anyone in, in achieving their potential. Now, I think that's powerful in itself. And I just want to know, what was the incentive and the inspiration behind setting up Pave the Way? And for anyone that's unaware, can you give a little bit more background to it? Because I think it is incredible. I can. And I'll just tell you a funny thing about, uh, since we're doing accents at the beginning, or each other, trying to do each other's accents, um, when I went to the United Nations, you get into this incredible, massive, big room, and everybody has a little thing that says what country they're from. And there's countries like you've never even heard of, and you're like, wow, like, it's just it's fabulous. It's just so diverse. It's dead exciting. And um, everyone's got earphones, but then they can understand everybody's language, and they just obviously pick their language. It translates it. And so a couple of English-speaking people had spoken before me. Um, and then there was, a, you know, some different languages and whatever. And then it was me. And what was dead funny, I started speaking. And even, like, Australia, America, and New Zealand and that were, like, um, <laughs> and really slowly put their earphones on and were clicking English. And I was like, Jesus. Like, <laughs> people even don't understand me in my own language. <laughs> Did you need subtitles in the US? Yeah. yeah. And I was like, all right, yeah, that Mancunian. They were like... What, what is this? What is she speaking? I thought she was speaking English. What the hell is she on about? So anyway, I don't know how they translated everything, but I tried to speak properly, you know. But um, yeah, so Pave the Way started in 2017 just as a one-week project. It was for Women's Sport Week. And I'd done loads of other people's projects for Women's Sport Week. I just wanted to do my own. And it yeah. co coincided by chance with the, the my pro debut, my professional debut. So... I wanted to do it about girls and women in sport initially, which we did. We did like loads of school visits, community visits. We did um, a photography exhibition of women who work in sport, which is now on permanent display at the velodrome. Um, and then I kind of didn't think much of it, but it, it, I don't think it resonated with people and people started using the hashtag pave the way and thinking about what it meant to them. And it just, I thought, you know what? I need to, I just need to carry on with this. It just felt right. Wow. And the, the two ways it's changed in that time is that one, because I've been doing a lot of talks at different places, I've realised that our story, uh, you know, as women in sport, is the story of women in law, in tech, in construction, and in lots of other industries. And I, I couldn't ignore that. So it's now about sport, but beyond sport. And what's more powerful on this planet than sport for making a positive change, especially when it's combined with business? It's, it's just an unbelievably powerful force for creating change. So... I thought it makes sense that sport's at the core of it, but it can impact every other aspect of society when you make a difference in sport. And then the second change is that it's about both genders. My lived experience has been obviously as a female in male-dominated sports, but I've had that many parents that have contacted me since who they've got a little boy who does ballet or whatever it might be, and they've given up because they get picked on loads. And I thought, Do you know what? I shouldn't accept that either. You know, it's, uh, everything's better if things are better for both sides, like with anything whether it's race, sexuality, disability, class, background, whatever it is. And I thought, you know, it's the same principle. So it's about 
all industries and both genders now. And we just got charity states about 10 weeks ago. So that's dead helpful in a pandemic. <laughs> what a great timing. But good things come out of crisis, don't they? So that's where we've got to look at it, you know. Um, absolutely. And congratulations for that, because that is an unbelievable thing that you've, you've managed to come up with this, this inspiration in terms of the project and then to get it into the charity status. That's not easy by the sound of it either. It's really so, hard. Yeah, hats off to you for that one. Um, but when you're saying in terms of, you know, the, the background that you had within sport has obviously helped um, provide inspiration for this, but also wider society and paved the way can have, you know, a wider, broader impact within society. Do you think that there was one particular moment where you thought, actually, no, I want to make a change. I want to pave the way for the future. I don't think there was. Um, no. But I think what's happened is a gradual awareness in yeah. me um, that I was always I was always alert to the fact that women women in sport were looked upon differently. In, in other words, as second class, they're not as good as the other. Um, but I internalised it and I believed it, yeah. and I thought that too because why would I think any different? Those were all the messages that I was getting. Over mm -hmm. time, though. I was still alert to it, but instead I was aware in a way that I'd educated myself and, you know, looked into it myself and challenged those thoughts and thought, well, why, why is it like that? And, and when I looked at the history of women's sport, all the sports we've been banned from, the myths that we've had to overcome, like that they used to say we shouldn't run marathons because our uterus would fall out. I mean, gee, I don't really know what a uterus is anyway, but <laughs> I really don't. But how ridiculous that women yeah. give birth and other stuff doesn't fall out. So you'd assume running would be all right, you know. But those kind of ridiculous things held us back for so long. When you look at it, you're like, right, that's why we... It's not true that we're not as good. Actual things have held us back. Um, and just a quick example of, of how that change manifests in me, like, day to day, is that as a 16-year-old and I got my first England call-up, I got that letter with, you know, with the three lines on and I mean, it's just the most, the, the email now, obviously, but back then it wasn't a yeah. thing and you used to get a letter and it was the most exciting thing ever. And I worked um, at the time and I went to my boss and said, oh, I need a week off, but there's nothing on the rotor. He said, what do you need a week off for? And I just gave him the letter and I was dead, dead excited. Yeah. And he said, um, you want me to give you a week off to play for a women's football team? I said, well, it is the England women's football team. And he went, ha! And he made all these jokes and these little, you know, and I said, can I just take it unpaid? It really means a lot to me. Yes, if you must. And I walked out of the office feeling really small. I felt like right. an idiot for thinking it was a big deal to play for not the England football team, but the women's England football team. And it really impacted me. I didn't tell anyone I was going. I didn't feel the same when I was listening to the anthem. I was like, it's not what I thought it would be this. It's not, you know, that's how it impacted me. Fast forward 20 years when I win the Commonwealth title in Zimbabwe, which was a fantastic experience going to Zimbabwe. Um, winning the title was amazing. And then I didn't get a belt. And when I got back and, and, you know, spoke to the Commonwealth Council about it, I was told they did replica belts for women and real belts for men. And they'd stopped making the replica belts. So I said, well, right, OK. And I said, well, how quickly can I have a, a, a real belt? Uh, to which they said, well, you know, they're quite expensive. So unless you've got a sugar daddy, um, you won't be able to have one. Now, 20 years before that, I wouldn't have used my voice. I'd have thought, well, yeah, of course we don't have real belts because we're not as good. Now I don't think that. And that's why now I know it's important for the likes of me and you and everybody on the Unlock programme and across, across women's sport when they feel ready to use that voice and say, no, actually. And that's where we can challenge it. So actually you shouldn't have said that. Um, you know, and now there's a women's title belt because of it. So it's ended up a positive. But that's the difference now. The, yeah. I was aware of it, but I just internalised it and believed it. Now I don't. I mean, two two absolutely incredible examples you've given. I kind of got a you know fury within inside myself hearing those. Um, but on the flip side, proof of what an incredible person you are that you do not stand for that. And actually, as a background, I've known Stacey now for probably about two, three months now um, through our involvement within the Women's Sports Trust Unlock campaign. And I'm not just saying this because you're on this call right now, but you have changed my outlook completely. And you've inspired me to want to make a difference in what I believe in. So, I mean, yeah. Also, can I just vouch that 
for anyone that wants to hear more, there is an incredible, incredible TED talk from Stacey on YouTube. Make sure you check it out. I'll, I'll put a link out later, but if you do anything this evening, you have to watch this YouTube TED talk. It is incredible. I promise you. But yeah, Stacey, yeah. incredible, incredible to hear. And, uh, yeah. Do you want me to um, tell you the story about my sister real quick? Oh, I promise you, I'll you. tell you. Can so, you tell it now? Yeah. Yeah, so my little niece, they, they're doing this thing where you had to dress up as a, a Mancunian. So she went as me, bless her, she, she, like, to school. Anyway, they have to Google the person they're going out. So she went in all boxing kit and oh, whatever. Yeah. Anyway, when I get to the house, she says, I've just Googled you. And I was like, okay. And she went, you were born in 1981 <laughs> and I was like right all right <laughs> okay shh. anyway and I said what else did you find out and she went you were born in Essex and I said yeah that's right and she went Essex and I said yeah yeah and she was like it was like a revelation to her she's like my god who is this aunt who I thought was a Mancunian <laughs> anyway my sister then says you were born in Essex and I'm like yeah she went really and I said you know this everybody knows I was born in Essex and she says God, all this time, I thought you were born in London. <laughs> Devastating. So like, said, Essex is in London. What are you talking about? And she was like, what? And I was like, Essex is in London. That's, that's what I'm dealing with in my family. <laughs> it's, it's, it's even in your passport that you were born in Essex, which is in the east side of London. So, I mean, even Stacey Copeland's um, sister doesn't know much about her and um, took her niece to uh, inform her of that. But She didn't I mean, know. The, well, she, she knew I was born in London, but she didn't know Essex was in London. Right. And I was like, come on. She even watches The Only Way is Essex. I was like, how can you not know it's in London? But that's what you're dealing yeah. with, Emily. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> what could have been, Stacey? If you would have kept with your Essex roots, what could have been, girl? But... Supported um, West Ham. Correct. Yeah, that's not a good thing, actually, to be fair to you. Anyway, I'm a bit wary of time, and I have got a few social media questions, if that's all right. Okay. Um, you actually answered Kate's um, question earlier on about, because she wanted to know what you prefer, football or boxing. Um, so that, that helps out. But I've got one from Olivia on Instagram, and uh, she said that she's recently purchased her own boxing gloves, and whilst training in lockdown and in general, do you think it's best to use punch bags or do you think having a sparring partner is, pa sparring partner is better? Um, it depends how experienced you are. If you're experienced, then sparring's fine. If you're yeah. not experienced, then go with a punch bag because yeah. obviously with sparring, you can hurt each other if you don't know what you're doing. Um, plus, you need a gum shield. Do you know what I mean? You should really have a head guard so there's some safety measures that you need to have really so if you haven't got all of that and you're inexperienced then i'd say punch bag still get a great workout okay interesting okay hope that helps olivia um becky on instagram this is a good one which animal would you say you are most like when you're in the boxing ring um i don't know probably um hopefully a lion a lion yeah i hope because <laughs> it's uh I think I'm a Leo, anyway, so technically speaking, technically. Yeah. How are you? Yeah. That, that makes a lot of sense. We're always the best people. No, it's it's a very Leo thing to say. No, um, <laughs> yeah, probably a lion, yeah. Because it comes All from right. the heart, doesn't it? Everything comes from the heart, so. Yeah, love that. Um, okay, one more. Alex on Instagram wants to know, who is your sporting hero? Um, do you know... I haven't really got sporting heroes. I've got people who I really admire what they've achieved. But my heroes are the people who I know, like the people in my family and friends, the athletes in the Unlock group, because I, because I know them. So, you know, I, I know who they are, what they stand for, the faults in some cases, but still, that the, you know, they've got that, those values at heart. So I think with, with, you know, really famous people, you don't know all that about them, do you? You just know what they've achieved. So... But I think in terms of, um, you know, who I admire for what they've achieved, there's just many, many, many of them. You know, Katie Taylor in boxing, obviously. And I have met her a few times and she's a, she's a great person. Um, Jess Ennis, I think it's incredible what she's achieved. And, you know, I've met her a couple of times. She was really, really, you know, dead approachable, friendly, had time for people. All of that stuff's important to me. So, um, so yeah, but real heroes are people, to be honest, who, who I know in, in my I life. That. Yeah, I love that. Um... Oh, amazing. Okay. Uh, well, I appreciate that. I hope they 
they uh, they appreciated your answer as much as I did. But um, I'm I'm wary that 30 minutes has absolutely flown by. I can talk <laughs> for years, um, but my my tea is empty, um, and I have one final. Thing to still say. going strong, you see. You've you've definitely got a never ending supply of Vimtol, haven't you? Let's be honest. I, have, I actually have. Unbelievable. Your street cred has gone right down, I tell you. <laughs> <laughs> no, theirs has gone up. Vimtol no. has gone up because of me. <laughs> Unreal. You, there, there's a sponsorship opportunity in that, just saying. <laughs> yeah. um, but, but yeah, so I, I've got one final thing to ask of you, if that's all right. So now I'm going to give you the power to decide what my first question for my next couple of Nanata guests on Monday should be, okay? So I'm banking on it being a cracker. Don't let me down. Who, who is it? Who's the person? Good is try. Good Secret. try. I like that, but I'm not telling you. Okay. Well, I don't know what area they're from, but it, it, it's, it uh, would apply to most people. And I would say, what is there from their area, uh, or if they haven't got like a local one, then just from England, what's their favourite slang term? Because I think as athletes, when you, when you play internationally... There's that many words that all of you say, and you're like, yes. what does that mean? And you haven't got a clue because we all have these little words from our area. So I'd ask them, what's their favourite like, localised slang term that they like to use? Well, I love it. That is such a good question. Also, very interesting that you assume that they're from England. Yeah, this is, this, is what, this is what I was asking, because if they're not, they might not have like a slang word like we do, because I know when I played football in America, they don't quite have, they don't have it quite the same as... I mean, they have some, but they don't have slang like we have it, do you know what I mean? But I think you could still apply it in some way. I think we can apply it. What's your lingo? I love the word chuffed. Chuffed. Which is a very northern word, and it, it, you know, but you can apply it to everything. It could be well chuffed, dead chuffed, proper chuffed, mega chuffed. <laughs> what hey, about I'm you? Dead I'm dead chuffed. Yeah, dead chuffed. Dead chuffed. I should That's have got very that... Good. I should have got that into my... Um, I know. My What's cancer. your favourite one? Um, I, I'm, I'm quite renowned for like shortening all my words. So obviously becomes obs or, or stuff like that. Um, what about I, um, like the ones that are famous to us, like the, when I think of Cockney's like Paka. Yeah. Do you use yeah, that? that and to be honest, most of the time, every time I'm talking to people, most of the time they can't understand the word I'm saying. So I'm talking <laughs> my own thing most of the time, to be fair. But, um, yeah, yeah, I'm excited to ask that question, actually. I'll let you know. Um, yeah, I think... Yeah, I think it's a good one. But my next cup and natter guest will actually be revealed on Sunday at 5pm. So keep your eyes peeled for that. Okay. Um, and I look forward to answering it. But in all seriousness, Stacey Copeland, thank you so much... Yeah. For joining. I really appreciate it. Thank you very much. Really appreciate it. And thanks for what you're doing. It's really, really important. And oh, thanks thank to you. everyone who's joined. We really, really appreciate it. We really do. Thank you. Yeah. And, and, and I'd just like to um, reiterate that if you do one thing this evening, please, please, please watch the TED Talk on YouTube, Stacey Copeland. It, it is incredible. 15 minutes, I think it is, isn't it, Stacey? Yeah, 15, and, yeah. Honest, honestly, it's game changing. Please watch it. But um, yeah, thank you so much for joining us. Really appreciate it. Everyone, keep that kettle boiled. Keep nattering using hashtag Cup and Natter. And I'll see you on Monday, same time, same place. Thank you so much. Cheers to the Vimto. Bye. <laughs> Bye. 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 Bye.